Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. And I'm Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, more than a thousand people out of their homes and the water keeps coming. It's a disaster. It's a disaster. A Manitoba First Nation battles back the floodwaters. It was completely by surprise. Like it really came up back within hours. The anxious wait as the river rises. The river water was stronger than the sandbags, stronger than anything. Also tonight, long security lineups make for tense traveling again. This is ridiculous. This is really not well organized. Why workers say just hiring more people is not a quick fix. Out of the darkness. Trapped underground for months, some civilians escape Mariupol and... harrowing stories from inside Bucha from those who survived the occupation. Plus, the post-restrictions playoffs begin. Hope on and off the ice. Hospitality has been shut down basically for the last two years. Any kind of boost in business is a welcome boost right now. This is The National. After weeks of flooding in Manitoba, tonight more than a thousand people have been forced to flee their homes. They live in a community north of Winnipeg that right now looks more like a lake. It is inundated with water that tonight is still rising. The threat and worry rising right along with it. Pegwa's First Nation is in Manitoba's Interlake region, sitting between Lake Manitoba and Lake Winnipeg. Running through it is the Fisher River, which is now flooding the community. And so many have sought safety elsewhere, but as Sam Sampson shows us, others have stayed to try to save what they can. This is the only way in and out. They were here to stop people in case they didn't know that the river was washed out. Jonathan Flett is doing what he can to fight all this water. It's really heartbreaking to see our community go through this struggle. He and his friends are traveling around the community to save houses, the water too deep to drive through. If we try to go through there with a the truck, our truck would possibly float away. Peguis is the biggest First Nation in Manitoba. 4,800 people live here. More than 1,000 have fled their homes because it isn't safe. Karen Kershane Parisian is now in Winnipeg and wonders if she'll have a home to go back to. Once the river started flowing into our yards, the river water was stronger than the sandbags, stronger than anything, and so our houses are full of water. This is my uh, golf course. William Sutherland is the emergency coordinator for the First Nation, trying to help his community and now save his own house too. I'm just hoping and praying that the water starts receding, right? So, but from what we witnessed last night, the water is still coming up. You can see how deep the water is and we're just walking away from a house right now. That's hitting the ground right there. Just a few feet that way is Fisher River and that has completely overflowed and caused damage to so many homes here in Pegwis First Nation. Waterways are swollen after the wettest April on record and ice jams burst open a dike just north of Pegwis. This community takes on water almost every year from the nearby river, but this is dire. And the situation could get worse with the crest days away. People here say they've never seen the water so high or so many roads washed out. On the roads still open, Flett and his crew head back to get more sandbags. The reason why we're staying is because we care for this community and we're going to be here right when, uh, right when it gets the worst. But others have to leave, so saying goodbye for now is the only way forward. So Sam, can you give us a sense of what people are preparing for over the next few days? Well, just watch this. This truck is walk going through all of that water. You can actually hear how fast it's going over the highway right now. That is expected to continue to rise, so much so that the chief here at Pegwis First Nation is asking for military help. Now, the evacuation coordinator told me earlier today she expects about 300 more people to leave Pegwis and go to Winnipeg for safety. She says anyone who stays to fight the flood should have at least 72 hours worth of supplies just in case they get stranded. Adrian. All right, Sam Sampson in Pegwis First Nation tonight. Thank you, Sam. Okay, now let's bring CBC News senior meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff into this conversation. Joe, what does the forecast hold for the next few days? Well, Andrew, ice jams can be a real wild card this time of the year. It's hard to forecast what the breakup of ice looks like, and we still have ice on Lake Winnipeg and Lake Manitoba to melt. Uh, and run through the water systems. But we do know extreme temperatures can mean a more volatile breakup. 
and the interlake region expect to see mid-teen temperatures by Wednesday and the 20s by the end of the week. Uh, and there's still a snowpack in the area that could add to the overland flooding. So still very much a touch and go situation north of Winnipeg, but at least we don't have another big rainmaker uh, piling on. Right, and, and that must be some good news for areas south of Winnipeg. Yes, uh, dry right across the province through to next weekend when we look at maybe a few showers for Sunday. But even then, it'll be the first weekend in three weeks that Manitoba isn't dealing with a huge precipitation maker. And that's really what has led to the flooding in the south. Uh, this has been an exceptionally wet spring. Uh, rainfall and precipitation averages four to six times the seasonal. So even though with the dry weather, we will see water levels continue to rise. The rise will start to slow and eventually stop later on this week. But Andrew, water levels expected to remain high uh, because of all the saturation uh, for quite some time. Okay, thanks Joe. You're welcome. This is the second week of travel trouble at some Canadian airports. Travelers still face painfully long lines, hours long delays, even missed flights, all due to critical security staff shortages. As Rafi Bujikanian shows us, patience is running thin. I'm a little bit stressed out, you know. We got a lot of baggages. At Canada's busiest airport, Pearson International, passengers were unimpressed. This is ridiculous. This is really not well organized. It was, it was incredibly unclear where we were supposed to be after we went through the, the electronic kiosks. Security screening lineups winding through the airport. Officials warn travelers to pack their patients and arrive early. I think my flight's at like 4 and like I got here at like 11. I'm like, I'm not missing my flight. I don't know. I just followed the Air Canada app, which it gives you like instructions on what time to get here. And they said by 12 for a flight at 3. So I'm hoping that gets me through in time. Long lines, approximately like more than 100 meters. This like, passenger yeah. described this morning at Pearson after arriving in Vancouver, where delays have dragged on for days. These departing travelers there took no chances. Because we read in the paper that there were people missing flights, and so we came six hours early. <laughs> in a statement, the Crown Corporation in charge of passenger screening, the Canadian Air Transport Security Authority, said they are not immune to recruitment and retention challenges faced by many industries at this time, and that they're working to hire and train more screening officers. But the Union of CATSA employees says it's not so simple. They failed to uh, properly train and skill employees. Dave and Flowers says wages are low for screening agents and current bargaining talks do not appear likely to change that. Quite frankly, they're offering 0%. So, you know, 0% won't fly. The federal minister of transport says relief for travelers is coming eventually. Weeks to get back to full uh, level of service that is needed, yeah. but the, in, uh, the infusion of resources is happening immediately. Now, are we going to see elimination of lineups immediately? I'll be honest with you, I don't think so. So Rafi, you're at the Ottawa International Airport, what are you hearing tonight? There were complaints this morning about long security lineups here too, Adrian. The airport authority tells us there just aren't enough screening agents to keep all stations open at all times. CATSA would not grant us an interview today, but in their statement suggested passengers arrive earlier. Two hours for domestic flights, three for international flights. All right, Rafi Bujikanian, thank you. You're welcome. In Ukraine, there are new attempts in the works to get more civilians out of the besieged city of Mariupol. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky confirmed that news tonight in a video address. A new humanitarian corridor is set to open up tomorrow morning with the support of the UN and the Red Cross. Hundreds of people still trapped, though, in bunkers under the city's now-destroyed steel factory. A brief ceasefire over the weekend did allow some to escape the rubble. Now, from those who did make it out, there are stories of survival and perseverance. David Common brings us their dramatic escape as Ukrainian forces improvise against the continued Russian assault. A warning, the story does include violent images of the battlefield. After more than two months underground, facing ghastly conditions, dozens emerged into the light. I can't believe it, says this woman. 
two months of darkness, using a flashlight to go to the bathroom in a bag. Their remarkable rescue, the result of secret talks brokered by the UN to escape the obliterated steel plant that has come to represent Ukrainian defiance, saving lives like baby Svetoslav's, six months old, half his life in war. The evacuees taken first to a Russian-controlled facility. Some have then been allowed to continue onwards to unoccupied areas. But for all the reunions once thought impossible, hundreds are still trapped. Ambulances and buses wait for them. Hope can be dangerous in war. There are no houses left anymore, says Olga Savina. Russia has used its superior firepower to flatten urban areas, forcing Ukraine to be creative, adapting consumer drones to drop bombs like this or this, hitting some Russian troops, leaving them unable to continue the fight. Russia came into this war with two-thirds of its combat soldiers. British intelligence says as many as a quarter are dead, wounded or out of action. In Kyiv, these National Guard soldiers patrol over worries Russian saboteurs are still active. The threat isn't finished, says Ranit. We're trying to find and neutralize them. Western-supplied weapons and years of training alongside NATO armies have supported Ukraine to stay in the fight this long. But in a week, Russia celebrates its Victory Day, marking the Soviet defeat of Nazi Germany. And some fear such a patriotic day will be used to surge more troops and weapons into Ukraine. David Common, CBC News, Kiev. Some European nations today said a ban on Russian oil could be the next step in punishing the Kremlin. It's been put off because of how punishing a ban is on importing countries too. Katie Simpson reports. European ministers called an emergency meeting to finalize their next moves against Russia. Attitudes in this circle have dramatically changed. What was once a pill too big to swallow now appears inevitable. Germany is not against an oil ban on Russia. Of course, it is a heavy load to bear, but we are ready to do that. The European Union is widely expected to impose an oil embargo on Russia in its next round of sanctions. There may be some carve-outs, as not all countries are on board, including Hungary. Transitioning will be difficult and expensive. The EU gets 40% of its gas and 26% of its oil from Russia. We also express our solidarity and we are ready to support countries, to supply them with non-Russian fossil fuels. We are ready to be solidarious with our infrastructure and to supply them if necessary. The plan would cause more instability on the global energy market and would be felt beyond Europe, including in Canada. You're going to see an increase in gas prices at home, but at the same time, uh, the oil producing parts of the country and are going to see higher prices and more money in the provincial coffers. The U.S. is also looking at additional ways to bolster support for Ukraine. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi met with Poland's president after her secret trip to Kiev over the weekend. Another chance for the U.S. to hear what more Ukraine's military needs. We do take our direction uh, in terms of what we can provide from them. So we, we listen to all of their requests and we do our best to meet what we can. President Joe Biden is urging lawmakers to get behind his new massive military aid package that would send $33 billion worth of weapons to Ukraine. This is one of a few issues to get bipartisan support. And while there may be some changes, Congress is likely to pass something relatively quickly. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Russia's ambassador to Israel has been summoned to the country's foreign ministry to apologize after comments Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov made on Italian television. Lavrov suggested Adolf Hitler was part Jewish. He made the comments while trying to justify Russia's excuse for war, the claim that Ukraine is a Nazi country, despite the fact that its president is Jewish. 
The Israeli foreign minister wrote that the statement was unforgivable and outrageous and that the lowest level of racism against Jews is to accuse Jews themselves of anti-Semitism. Canada's prime minister also spoke out against Lavrov today. What the Russian foreign minister just said uh, is unbelievable. We need to stand condemning ever stronger uh, the ridiculous and unacceptable positions of Russia. Condemnation of the comments also came from governments in Italy and Germany. As the West intensifies its sanctions against Russia, middle-class Russians are being hit hard, including those working in the auto sector. Briar Stewart takes us to a Russian auto town where thousands are out of work, but still few will speak out against the war. This is the route that Alexander Abrosimov has driven to work for the last 12 years. He's a mechanic at Volkswagen in Kaluga, Russia, but is one of 4,000 employees who've now been told to stay home and wait for a call. <laughs> But this time, those cutbacks are because of war. Volkswagen stopped operating in part because sanctions have made it difficult to get a hold of supplies. Abrosimov and the rest of his co-workers are getting paid some of their wages, but it's not clear how long that will last. Kaluga is an industrial town of 320,000, and its three foreign car makers have all suspended production leaving 7,000 employees with an uncertain future. Beyond Kaluga, this automotive journalist said most of Russia's car production is either suspended or struggling. Since the invasion began, more than 700 foreign companies have pulled out or cut back their operations in Russia. Locals complain that sanctions have led to a rise in food prices, but it's rare to find someone like this woman, who's against the war and fears for the future. Patriotism is strong here. Throughout the cities, there are posters of the letter Z a symbol of support for the military. Back at Volkswagen, Abrosimov is optimistic and says Russia can concentrate on other markets. Хорошо, что Европа и США, страны Запада, это не весь мир. У нас есть азиатский регион. But that's no guarantee this factory can restart anytime soon. In a country increasingly cut off by sanctions, the question is just how long can business sit idle? Friar Stewart, CBC News, Riga. Ukraine says it has identified 10 Russian soldiers it believes have committed war crimes in the town of Bucha, where civilians were tortured and killed. Tonight, a story of survival from one man who lived through the massacre. Also ahead, my conversation with the Archbishop of Canterbury on a historic apology to residential school survivors and what the Anglican Church is willing to do next. First of all, I am so sorry. And the students who managed to get their entire school district an important day off. You feel included. It's like, maybe I can belong to this place. We're back in two. There is a story developing tonight in the United States that could signal a major change coming to abortion rights in that country. Politico says it has obtained a draft opinion circulated in February among Supreme Court justices. It shows that at the time, a majority were in support of overturning Roe v. Wade, which legalized abortion in the U.S. almost 50 years ago. Initial positions do sometimes change, and the case has not yet been formally decided. Several states have laws that would immediately ban abortion if that court overturns the ruling. Politico says it's the first time a draft has been leaked from the high court. New York's governor has already said tonight her state will always guarantee the right to abortion. In a month, Ontario voters will choose their next premier. Doug Ford is leading in the polls, but his two main challengers hope to close the gap with some big promises.
that an Ontario Liberal government will reduce transit fares right across Ontario down to $1 per ride within 100 days of taking office. Ontario Liberal leader Stephen Del Duca with a pitch to commuters today, while Ontario opposition and NDP leader Andrea Horvath is promising to ease pressure on the health care system by making it easier to hire foreign-trained nurses. So uh, immediately 2,000 uh, practicing nurses will be able to get their credentials uh, and 15,000 uh, shortly thereafter. Horvath says her plan will help reduce emergency room wait times and surgery backlogs, but as his term winds down, Progressive Conservative Premier Doug Ford had a big government announcement of his own today, potentially worth thousands of jobs in the auto sector. Doug Ford and Justin Trudeau have pledged a combined billion dollars in funding to make electric vehicles in Ontario. It is the latest friendly collaboration between two leaders who haven't always gotten along. But as David Cochran explains, they do have common goals, namely staying tight with Ontario voters. It's another big government investment in the Ontario auto sector, one that had the Liberal Prime Minister and the Progressive Conservative Premier together again. It's always a good day to be able to work together for Ontarians. Thank you to the, the Prime Minister. It wasn't that long ago these two were political enemies. All of you in Ontario remember well what Doug Ford did. Cuts, cuts, cuts. I think the guy loves me or something because he constantly mentions my name. But since the bare knuckle battles of 2019, the two leaders have worked together surprisingly well. Cutting deals on child care, gold mining, and a string of electric vehicle announcements. This latest by Stellantis means billions of dollars to create hundreds of jobs in Windsor and Brampton. I don't, I don't care about the political stripes. The people expect us to get done. We're getting it done. This electric vehicle announcement comes two days after Ford fueled up his election bus, revving for re-election while courting many of the same people who voted for Justin Trudeau last year. The timing, pure coincidence, says the Prime Minister. This is good news that I know the people of Windsor uh, wouldn't want it to have waited a day longer for. So unlike this joint appearance, it shouldn't be seen as an endorsement. And Ford's rivals are trying to downplay any political boost. I think people want politicians to, to work together. I, I think that that's what they want. The Prime Minister is governing, but Doug Ford for now more than a year has been campaigning full time. The Prime Minister's office is adamant they aren't trying to help Ford. The auto sector is a critical national industry. The transition to electric vehicles an urgent priority. They insist the timing so close to the Ontario election really is a coincidence as the date and time were chosen by Stellantis. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. In Ukraine, the search is on for the Russian soldiers believed to have committed war crimes in Bucha. Next, a harrowing glimpse at what life was like inside that city under Russian control. Our team traveled to the region to hear directly from those who survived the massacre. Welcome back. As Russian troops retreated from the suburbs of Kyiv, images of civilians lying dead in the streets were the world's first look at the horrors that had unfolded. Now, Margaret Evans and her team take us back to the city of Bucha, where they spoke to those who lived through the atrocities, including one man who says Russian troops made him believe more than once he was just moments away from being executed. A warning, the images you're about to see and the stories you're about to hear are graphic, but they're important. The trees began to bud on Yablunska Street not long after Russian soldiers withdrew from Bucha. It means Apple Tree Street in English. But the horror that still hangs in the air makes even the approach of spring feel an affront to those who died on this street and all around it. The images of their bodies left to rot for weeks were among the first to alert the world to the atrocities Russian soldiers stand accused of when they occupied sleepy commuter towns around Kyiv. They don't have an army. They have marauders, rapists and killers who have weapons and carte blanche to do what they want. 
Volodymyr Lizovsky took these videos, stolen glimpses of an unfolding nightmare. They tell the story of those who survived, hiding in basements, keeping to the shadows. We met him in a Kyiv hospital, recovering from surgery to repair a broken bone in his face. Lizovsky is a biker. He owned a Harley Davidson repair shop before it was destroyed in the fighting. He and his extended family live on a cross street, just three houses from Yablunska. He says the Russian attacks on civilians intensified on March 18th. Not only on the streets, they started to come into houses to do searches, and we heard shootings inside other houses. We knew that a lot of people stayed in Bucha for different reasons. The shootings were happening all around the city. The back of Lizovsky's house borders another, one street over, that was taken by the Russians to live in and left like this. They used to ask him for water from the family well, he says. Then they demanded their mobile phones, searching for names, and next they came to steal jewelry. The knock on the door on March 29th was the most dangerous of all. My mother and father were trying to stop them from taking me, but Russians said if my parents got in their way, it would get worse. They took him to a nearby house, he says, and beat him, demanding he confess to helping the Ukrainian army. When he refused, they took him outside and walked him the short distance to Yablunska Street. They brought me to a place where bodies of people who had been killed earlier were lying. They made me kneel there. They put gun to my head and fired an axe to my ear. One of the bodies still lying on the street that day belonged to Volodymyr Brovchenko, a man in his 60s killed by a sniper around March 5th, according to neighbors. His bike remained even after Ukrainian troops had liberated Bucha and removed his body. Someone had laid out his belongings, too, a memorial of sorts. He was going to work on his bike, says Ihor, a family friend who prefers not to give his last name. He worked in Vorzel at the orphanage. We wanted to take him and bury him, but as we came out to the intersection, we saw Russians and retreated right away. After his refusal to confess, Lizovsky was beaten again before being subjected to a second mock execution. He doesn't know why they didn't kill him. I can't answer that. I don't have any idea. Possibly because of my weight. I didn't meet the bar to serve in the army, so they thought I did not pose any danger. His ordeal ended when two of his captors delivered him back home on the same day. They gave me a cigarette and said I was being born again. When my mother saw me, she started to cry and said to the soldiers, when you go back home, tell your parents what you saw here. One of the soldiers said, I won't, because it's a shame. Three days later, Ukrainian troops entered Bucha, recording on body cameras what the Russians had left behind. By mid-April, Ukrainian prosecutors had reported finding the bodies of 278 people and counting in Bucha alone, nearly all of them civilians, many with their hands tied behind their backs. They've appealed to the public to help gather evidence, and just last week published photos of 10 Russian soldiers accused of taking civilians hostage in Bucha and torturing them, all from the same brigade as those accused of tormenting Vladimir Lizovsky. We will restore and renew our lives in Bucha, and we will find all of the people who committed these crimes. Lizovsky's physical scars are healing, but he won't admit to psychological ones. He's joined a territorial defense unit, and there is clearly anger sketched across his being, but not fear, he says, not in your own home. Ask him what he dreams about at night, though, and he declines the question. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Bucha. 
Now, Margaret mentioned the hunt for those 10 Russian soldiers accused of war crimes. Well, today, Ukraine Security Service says it's identified almost 900 Russian soldiers suspected of committing crimes against civilians in the Kyiv region. And authorities have also said they're looking into at least 10 cases of local residents in the Bucha area suspected of collaborating with Russian troops. Some Ukrainian children who have now left the country are settling here in Canada, starting new schools, forging new lives, and doing what kids always try to do, that is to say, make new friends. Deanna Sumanak-Johnson shows us how experts say schools can help ease that transition. It's never easy being new in class, but especially if you're nine and you just came from a war zone. This is Hlieb. But Hlieb Elin at least does not need to worry about understanding his teachers. The Winnipeg public school he now goes to is bilingual, with classes taught in English and Ukrainian. We know that our school is such a wonderful place for them to come to because of that Ukrainian language that's spoken daily in the hallways. Okay. But for many kids who end up in more typical schools, classrooms can be another source of stress, says the settlement coordinator. We definitely need more support, more sufficient funding to make sure students are getting the support that they need with regards to language, because language is the most important barrier for them. There are other types of training educators need too, things that the well-established Ukrainian community in Winnipeg is able to provide. We're having a specific session from a trauma counselor at that session to talk about how to recognize um, trauma, how to support trauma. This researcher, who came as a refugee from the former Yugoslavia herself, says there are also things teachers can do on their own. It's about group work. It's about um, facilitating, encouraging peer support and mentoring. Her other suggestions? Focus on new students' strengths rather than deficiencies. Get students to express ideas in nonverbal ways. Share stories or lessons about newcomers' culture. And that's exactly what Lieb Elin is getting now. We all like played with him at recess. We also like showed him around the school and taught him the rules. As kids offer their own help in the universal language of friendship. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. When we come back, a conversation with the Archbishop of Canterbury. After delivering a historic apology this weekend to residential school survivors, I'll ask him about the meaning behind those words and what more the Anglican Church is actually prepared to do. Welcome back. I am about to speak with a man who just this weekend made history in Canada. Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury and the worldwide leader of the Anglican Church, listened to stories of suffering from residential school survivors. And then he apologized for what he called the grievous sins of his church. Sins of racism, of discrimination, the greatest evils we can face. The Anglican Church of Canada ran about three dozen residential schools at different times over a period of nearly 150 years. Residential schools, uninspected, unsupervised, uncriticized, unchallenged in their cruelty. He didn't sugarcoat anything. He called it what it was. Rhonda Sanderson's parents and grandparents were sent to residential schools run by churches. Her own was not. She told the Archbishop of her family's painful legacy and says she was profoundly moved by his apology. To say sorry, you didn't offer it as a soundbite. You didn't stay in your home country and say, well, we're sorry. You came. Now, to tell us more about the apology and where actions meet words, we have Archbishop Justin Welby joining us. Thank you for making this time to join us. I appreciate that. I'm very glad to be able to speak to you. Archbishop, I, I tend to think that the measure of an apology is in the person's ability to articulate what exactly they're apologizing for. When it comes to residential schools in Canada, for what are you sorry? It would be a very long list, longer than this interview would allow, but the specifics are, first of all, the way 
the schools were run. Secondly, what someone referred to me, and it seems a good phrase, as the cu attempted cultural genocide, the removal of the culture, the spirituality, even at times almost the soul and the humanity of, of those who were there, the attempt to remove them from life in Canada. Thirdly, the collusion and cooperation of the Anglicans in the residential schools as opposed to standing alongside the victims and survivors and even if they couldn't stop it, at least standing up against it. Um, and fourthly, the systematic cruelty and abuse that were absolutely intrinsic to the way these schools run. You've called what has happened a terrible crime. And I'd like for you to listen to one of the victims of those crimes, uh, Roberta Hill, who is a survivor of one particular school, the Mohawk Institute. Take a listen to this. I would like to know what has been done within the church itself, the Anglican church, to address the issues of sexual abuse that was pretty rampant across this country. But I was in the Mohawk Institute and I know that it happened there because I'm one of the victims. And um, it's had such a devastating effect on all of our communities. And, and you know, we're still dealing with the impacts of that. So how are they going to make changes within the church so that this doesn't happen again? Archbishop, your response. I, I first of all, I am so sorry. I want to repeat what I said in terms of apology and grief. It is a serious disciplinary offense for any clergy person or officer of the church to seek to hide, to cover up, or to conceal abuse of any kind, especially sexual abuse of children or vulnerable ad adults. Secondly, there is extensive training that is now being introduced to take people immensely seriously and treat them with dignity and profound respect. Thirdly, uh, to have independent oversight and checking of what is going on. What about money? I mean, you know, we've also heard from survivors who think that there is no sincerity in an apology that is not matched with a financial commitment. The church has billions right. of dollars in assets. How much of that is the church willing to part with to make things right? The Church of England's funds are not within my control. And they are uh, under act of parliament uh, confined to the use of England, an act of parliament going back to the 18th century. However, that does not, that's not to say we aren't going to do anything, but it means that what we are going to do, first of all, has to be within the law. Secondly, it has to be discussed with the survivors. It's not just a case of our patronizing them by handing things out. Everything has to be done in collaboration with survivors rather than a top-down, outside-in approach. I guess, I, you know, I, no one's asking for, for handouts, but I guess the question is really just about material compensation for material harm. And I suppose what I'm wondering is, do you feel that survivors here in Canada are owed more than what they've been given? I'm not sure I'm able to give a truthful and good answer to that question because um, the last two days have been my first direct encounter with what happened. And I think um, I can't, I, it's not within my uh, gift to promise funds. And one of the things I said to the survivors yesterday when they asked me the same question was I'm not gonna promise what I can't deliver. Okay, well, Archbishop Justin Walby, we will have to leave it there, but I, I know your schedule is a demanding one, so I do appreciate you taking the time to join us. Thank you. Thank you. Now, support is available for anyone affected by residential schools. There is a 24-hour national crisis line. The number right there on your screen, 1-866-925-4419. And when we come back, a lot of hockey fans in this country are hoping this year will be their year. We got Austin Matthews. 
I think that's all you need. Austin right? Matthews. Austin Matthews. AM three four. AM three four. Morgan Riley. Yeah, I don't Come know. On. How do you lose? How do you lose? How do you lose? How do you lose? We'll look at what's at stake as the NHL playoffs start without pandemic restrictions. Welcome back. The Stanley Cup playoffs are officially underway. Three Canadian teams have made it in. Calgary, Edmonton and Toronto. And as Aaron Collins explains, a win by any of them would be a win for Canada after a nearly three decade long championship drought. Final preparations for a cup run. The Oilers playoff push led by two of hockey's brightest stars. It's obviously exciting. It's an exciting day. Um, it's nice, nice to start at home. Um, you know, you work all season towards um, essentially this game. In Toronto, another playoff puck drop as hope springs eternal for Leafs fans. We got Austin Matthews. I think that's all you need. Right? Austin Matthews, Austin Matthews. AM34, AM34. Morgan Riley? Yeah, I don't Come know. On. How do you lose? How do you lose? How do you lose? But odds makers say the Flames are the Canadian club with the best chance of winning it all. Just don't tell their coach that. You're not a proven playoff team or anything until you, till you make it several years in a row and then, and then you have some success. That's if you look at the history of champions. All three Canadian teams in the playoffs have at least a shot at winning the cup, something a Canadian club hasn't done since 1993 when Montreal won. Since then, despite a few chances, it's been nearly 30 years of heartbreak for Canada. I think that for Canadian hockey fans, I mean, maybe you don't want your biggest rival to win it, but we, we need to break this drought, and there's a real, real sense of that among fans. Along Calgary's Red Mile, there is hope that drought could end this year. I believe the Flames have all the tools to make it that happen, absolutely. We just got to, you know, play some defensive hockey. It's going to be a long playoff run. And after two trying years, many businesses are banking on a long run. Hospitality um, has been shut down basically for the last two years throughout the pandemic. So any kind of boost in business is a welcome boost right now. So for fans in Toronto, Edmonton and here in Calgary, there's at least hope that they'll be able to see their teams bring the Stanley Cup home to Canada. But perhaps more importantly, after two years mostly on the sidelines, those fans will be able to cheer on their teams from inside NHL arenas. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. And when we come back, the high schoolers affecting change across their entire school district. You feel included to start off. It's like, maybe I can belong to this place. Why they're celebrating more than just Eid today. Next. Eid Mubarak. Muslims across Canada gather to celebrate Eid today, reconnecting after a month of fasting and reflection. It is the first Eid since 2019 without pandemic restrictions. Many Muslim students, though, are used to being marked absent as they stay home to celebrate the Islamic holiday. But that will change next Eid in one Alberta school district, all thanks to a group of students and administrators. Their push for change is our moment. When we started this, I didn't think like, it would turn out how it's done, and it's like pretty amazing. You shouldn't really have to miss a class because you're celebrating like a holiday. We have a big number of Muslim students in our school. We wanted our day off too, so we kind of brought it up. We're like, is it possible? I'm so, so, so grateful to have this opportunity and to be able to do these, do these things with these amazing people and have so, so much support from staff and parents and just like a community. It feels refreshing to know that like all our efforts and all, I guess, our struggles and complaints um, behind closed doors are finally being heard. You feel included to start off. It's like, maybe I can belong to this place. I thought I didn't really have a voice, so like, getting an answer right away. I was actually surprised and impressed and thankful. <laughs> Knowing that my Muslim friends or like everybody in the school is getting a day off for Eid, that's just like an accomplishment. Yeah, indeed. And so, you know, this does take effect next year, as we, as we pointed out, that will be the first year. They say the next mission is to try to establish a prayer space, like a dedicated room where Muslims can go to pray each and every day. And, uh, you know, it makes sense at the school. A third of the students are Muslim. For sure. And inspiration is, is contagious. They've already uh, 
worked with a, a school in Medicine Hat to start their own group. Mm. And it's a nice ripple. Mm. That is a national for May the 2nd. Good night. Good night.